The Delaware County Historical Society presents From Slavery to Freedom, presented by Watson Walker, Jr. On February 15th, Delaware County Historical Society volunteer Watson Walker, Jr. presented a program about the history of African Americans who lived and worked in Delaware County and northern Franklin County. This program features information about Africa Road, the Underground Railroad, the Lucy Depp Settlement, the Alum Creek Quaker Abolitionists, and much more. So our program tonight is... You know, February is Black History Month, so our program tonight is we're going to show a video called From Slavery to Freedom and Underground Railway Sites, and our speaker is Watson Walker, Jr. <laughs> Watson got his Bachelor of Arts from Fisk University and his Master of Arts from the University of Dayton. He's been president of the Delaware County Geolog Genealogical Society. And he's been a member since 2007. He's been a member of the Delaware County Historical Society as well since 2007. Uh, he's the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. He's written three books on the Underground Railway and six dime novels, part of the Black History series. So with that, Watson's gonna give an introduction to the video, and then we'll talk about how we wanna handle questions tonight. Watson's vision for hearing impaired so we've got a strategy to help him be able to read questions. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Watson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm hoping I can out talk these microphones. In February 1793, slavery was abolished in Canada. In July of the same year, the United States Congress passed the Fugitive uh, Slave Law. Ten years later, in 1803, Ohio was admitted into the Union as a free slave state. By the 1820s, the Underground Railroad became popular for those seeking to escape from the institution of slavery. The Underground Railroad was a code name of a secret organization who helped slaves to flee the uh, plantations and farms in the South and traveled north seeking freedom to Canada. The Underground Railroad was not a subway or a tube station. It was a code name for the vast network of groups that organized, unplanned, unscheduled wealth for, un <clears throat> for runaway slaves. The name the Underground Railroad was selected because it coincided with the same time the first American railroad industry began. The word underground was added to better undefine the secrecy of the Underground Railroad. In Ohio, the Underground Railroad had Methodists, emancipated blacks, Quakers, and others with their lives to assist runaway slaves by organizing escape routes, guiding them to safe places, gave them money, provide them with food and clothes. Their biggest challenge was to try to aboard the, uh, slave, <clears throat> the slave patrol. The slave patrol would hire, would, would hire bounty hunters who would pay to catch the runaway slave and return them back to their rightful owners and plantation. The video from Slavery to Freedom that you're about to view will give you a better perception and understanding about how the Underground Railroad was operated in Ohio. I will answer questions after the video. Those who are in the room attending, you may submit your questions to me, clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question. The people who are right here in the barn you will be given a card to add uh, questions and write your questions on the card. Steve will collect them, and then I would, you know, start with the questions with the uh, June, and then whatever is left, I would talk with them. With no further ado, then we're going to see the movie. From Slavery to Freedom, created by Watson Walker, Jr., read by Mark Butler and Francine Butler. Sponsored by the Delaware County Historical Society, Delaware, Ohio. 
From the beginnings of our country and the founding fathers, the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution, the institution of slavery has been an issue. The ideal of enslaving people to do the backbreaking work on the southern plantations kept the concept of slavery alive so the work would get done without paying for the labor. Though there were also slaves in the north, it was not so widespread as in the south. So the enslaved workers decided to take their freedom into their own hands and run away. The Fugitive Slave Laws of 1850 made it illegal for any citizen to assist slaves in escaping their bondage, and so the bounty hunter system got started. The slave catchers traveled all over the countryside hunting down the fugitive slaves also called runaways, to take them back to the plantations. Often, they were brutally punished for running away. In addition, anyone helping the runaways could be heavily fined. Unfair court systems and judges could decide the fate of captured runaways. The Underground Railroad became a secret way of helping the enslaved find a path to freedom. Slaves found a way of getting their freedom by using the Underground Railroad. This wasn't a real railroad, and it did not travel necessarily underground. It was a secret trek, traveling through unfamiliar territory to safe places. Runaway slaves used the Underground Railroad to escape from the South, where slavery was legal. The Underground Railroad was used in the North and Ohio and many other states on the way to Canada to get freedom. Slaves were sold at a moment's notice. There would be times slaves attempted to escape to avoid being sold. Often, a phrase or code was used in the Underground Railroad. It was used to alert slaves on the plantation that some of the slaves among them were going to make an attempt to escape for freedom. Steal away was a song used meaning an escape was being planned. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Captain William McLean, born in Virginia, became a riverboat captain like his father along the Ohio River. He was an ardent abolitionist. Captain William McLean searched the Ohio River for fugitive slaves from Kentucky and would lead them to J.J. Minor in southwestern Ohio. Minor, as a conductor, would transport the runaways to two black farmers, Dan Lucas or Joseph Love and on to their farms located north of Portsmouth, Ohio. The runaway slaves would stay at the Dan Lucas farmhouse for several days. Lucas provided them plenty of food, warm shelter, and fresh clothing. When the runaways were moving north, they were reminded of some of the lessons they had learned on the plantation. For example, the dead trees will show them the way. This was a reminder that moss grows on the north side of dead trees, so when the north star was not visible, they would still know which way to walk. Another thing they were told was to follow the north star in the Big Dipper constellation, sometimes called the drinking gourd. The North Star guided their nighttime escapes. The song, Follow the Drinking Gourd, represents that part of the flight to freedom. A house that had candles or lanterns in the windows was a signal that this house could be considered a safe place for visitors, in other words, fugitive slaves. The homeowner would welcome the visitors with open arms they would feed them, provide them a warm shelter, and maybe some fresh clothing. So 
Sometimes the visitors would hide in the basement or the attic of the house. They could also be hidden in barns, outside sheds, sometimes even in cornfields or trees. Caves were another safe place that slaves could hide from the slave patrols and bounty hunters. The Lucy Depp Farm in southwest Delaware County near Dublin was settled by Abram Depp and his family when they were given their freedom and traveled from Virginia to Ohio in 1834. They started helping other slaves who were seeking freedom. The limestone caves along the Scioto River would hide runaway slaves until the coast was clear. When they could hear the bell ringing from the Abram Depp farm, they knew it was safe to continue their journey. Mr. Fernando Cortez Kelton and his wife Sophia, both noted abolitionists, were active in the Columbus area. As runaway slaves were brought to the Keltons, often the next step was to contact Reverend James Poindexter, an abolitionist and pastor of the Second Baptist Church in Columbus. Reverend Poindexter was a leading supporter of the Underground Railroad and one of the most noted conductors in the Columbus area. He was known to supply horses and wagons to help runaway slaves. Ready to move to the next station, Poindexter contacted Reverend Jason Bull, minister for Clinton Chapel. Bull asked one of his parishioners, John Ward, a free black man, to take the visitors to Clintonville, located north of Columbus. And so the Underground Railroad station-to-station -station journey continues. John T. Ward picked up the visitors at the Kelton House and transported them to Clintonville, Ohio. This was probably done under the cover of darkness as well. Interestingly, a few years later, John Ward and his family were instrumental in hauling supplies to the soldiers stationed at Camp Chase during the Civil War. Their business thrived and eventually became the Ward Transfer and Storage Company with the proud heritage of hauling people to freedom at night and transporting goods by day. Reverend Jason Bull, a Clintonville Methodist minister, and his family welcomed the visitors by feeding them and providing them a warm shelter and fresh clothing. They first hit the runaways in barns on the east side of High Street with Jason's daughter carrying food and drink to them in an egg basket, as though out gathering fresh eggs. The work the entire Bull family supported during the years of the Underground Railroad was remarkable. On the next leg of this journey, Reverend Jason Bull instructed his brother Nathan Thompson that Bull would ride ahead to Westerville and contact Bishop William Hanby to let him know that he would be receiving some visitors in a few days. After receiving the message from Reverend Bull, Bishop Hanby asked George Stoner, another church member and abolitionist of the Underground Railroad, to use his stagecoach to pick up the visitors up by the church coming from Columbus. Stoner had a regular route that ran every other day from Columbus to Westerville. He would pick up the travelers as part of his route and act as if it were business as usual. Sometimes Stoner's stagecoach passengers wore various disguises. Female runaway slaves wore clothing fashionable at the time and rode in the cab as passengers. Hiding under the cover of luggage, the male runaways rode on the top and in the back of the stagecoach. Here is an example of a woman and her baby who were light-skinned black Americans and were able to pass as whites. They could sneak by a slave catcher without drawing attention to themselves. 
When the stagecoach arrived at the tavern owned by George Stoner, who was also a conductor on the Underground Railroad, the runaways hid in the basement of the tavern in Westerville. Because he owned and operated a stagecoach business, he had the perfect opportunity to hide and transport runaways onto the next station. Other local citizens and church members cooperated by donating food, money, clothing, and the use of vehicles. Pictured here is Westerville resident Thomas Alexander, a station master, a conductor, and an operator in the Underground Railroad. According to the Westerville Public Library, slaves were hidden in his foundry before they were moved further north, concealed in his wagon among farm utensils produced in his business. He would place one of his children on the wagon, seat beside him, and head northwest in broad daylight, delivering his hidden cargo to their next stop. There is a local story that one time when night fell, two black couples sneaked out of the basement and walked to Alexander's foundry. When they arrived, Alexander hid them inside the plant. While the workers were busy, the couples slept soundlessly. A few days later, Alexander transported the couple to the Hanby's barn. William Hanby kept bars on the windows of his barn to protect his saddle and harness business inside. Actually, it kept nosy people from exploring the barn where freedom seekers were hidden. The Hanbys had a dog named Towser who barked when people came near the barn. Hanby was known to bring freedom seekers into his home for a hot meal and a prayer before moving them on to the next stop. When son, Benjamin Hanby, lived at home in Westerville, he would make sure the Otterbein campus was quiet so he could alert family members to release the visitors. Ben would then go down to the street whistling a tune while the runaways followed the sound of Ben's whistling. In this way, Ben could lead them to meet up with whomever was taking them to the next stop. Squire Faust, William's father, bought the Hanby house for $50 in 1871 when he moved his family to Westerville. William and his brothers grew up in this house. William was the first black American to graduate from Westerville High School. He was also the first black American to graduate from Otterbein University in 1893 and went on to become a teacher and school principal. Years later, when the house was in a state of disrepair and William had become a successful educator, he contributed to fundraising efforts to preserve the house. According to Columbus City Scene Magazine, when the Hanby House, a former stop on the Underground Railroad, struggled with preservation, William Faust extended a helping hand because the original buyers could no longer afford the upkeep. An interesting story about William is how he urged his student to contribute one penny toward the restoration of the house and was quite proud when he presented $150 toward this preservation project. Another local story relates the early morning that William Alexander loaded his wagon with farm products. Runaway couples hid in a secret compartment in the wagon. Alexander and one of his sons drove to the Garrett Sharp farmhouse out in the country toward Delaware County. From there, one of the Sharp sons drove another wagon with the couples hiding in his wagon to East Orange, also known as Africa, Ohio. In 1841, Sharp built a lovely home of brick fired on the property and black walnut wood from the surrounding forest. Because he was a farmer, he also built several barns to house his animals and store the food and grain he harvested. He built this secret hiding place near the fireplace in his home. 
Garrett Sharp was one of the original settlers in this area around Westerville on Africa Road. He was the leader of the Sharp Settlement, a stronghold of abolitionists and active in the local Methodist church, which opposed slavery. He and his sons were very active in the anti-slavery activities and helped many of the runaway slaves move on to other Underground Railroad stations. This historical marker commemorates the anti-slavery work of the Sharp family. Africa, Ohio, or Africa in Ohio. Do not confuse Africa, Ohio with Africa in Ohio. In Ohio, there are actually two places called Africa, Ohio. One is in Southern Ohio in Jackson County, and another one is in Delaware County. The one in Jackson County near Jackson, Ohio, is in the southern part of the state, not far from the Ohio River. That settlement was called Africa in Ohio. They also have similar places called Berlin associated with the Underground Railroad. In Jackson County, Berlin Crossroads was a predominantly black community called Africa in Ohio. Berlin Township was associated with Africa Road and Africa, Ohio in Delaware, Ohio. They both had a notable former slave named Polly. Polly Jackson was well known in Jackson County and Polly Noco was known in Delaware County. There are different accounts of the story on why East Orange was renamed Africa, Ohio. One account about Africa, Ohio can be found in the 1880 history of Delaware County and Ohio. Samuel Patterson's farm, located in East Orange, was one of the major stops on Africa Road and part of the Underground Railroad network for a number of slaves fleeing to Canada. These activities may inspire the slave patrols to rename East Orange Africa, Ohio. The group of slaves arriving in Ohio in 1858 became known as the Freed Alston Slaves. One account of their story describes that of widow Miriam Alston from a North Carolina plantation and a slave owner. She emancipated a group of 36 men, women, and children in Orange County, North Carolina. With the help of two white men, they traveled north by foot and in wagons and crossed the Ohio River to finally settle down near Samuel Patterson's farm in Delaware County, Ohio. The Westerville Public Library states that Samuel Patterson settled north of Westerville in 1824 in a small village named East Orange. The community had a general store, a blacksmith shop, a boot and shoe store, and eight homes. Patterson built a double log cabin and got married in 1827. These barns were very important for another reason. They were where Samuel Patterson hid special secret visitors to his farm. Samuel Patterson was part of the Underground Railroad. He and his neighbors all agreed that slavery was a bad thing and that they would do whatever they could to help freedom-seeking slaves. There were log cabins in the woods that also served as hiding places for the fleeing slaves who came through the village near Alum Creek. One of Samuel Patterson's neighbors, Reverend John W. Thompson, was also active in the Underground Railroad. The emancipated slaves mentioned earlier as the Alston freed slaves arrived in time for the harvest season. The local farmers enticed them to stay and work on their farms. Many former slaves did stay in the area, which may have inspired the locals to rename their community Africa, Ohio. Other former slaves relocated to Westerville, Worthington, 
and outlying townships in Delaware and Franklin counties. Shortly after the Civil War ended, many former slaves took their slave owner's name, Alston or Austin, while residing in places in Ohio, such as Delaware, Franklin, Paulding, and Van Wert counties. Mary Frances Alston was the daughter of Andrew and Sarah Alston and the youngest child to arrive in Africa, Ohio, being only two years old at that time. As a child, her family was acquainted with the Hanbys and she met Benjamin as a little girl. Mary was quite a gifted artist and in later years taught art in Chattanooga, Tennessee. During World War I, she served as a Red Cross nurse and after the war, she was a cook for two fraternity houses on Ohio Wesleyan University campus. She gave this interview to the Delaware Gazette newspaper in 1950 at the age of 94, where she is showing her freedom papers here and telling her life story. Runaways sheltered by friendly abolitionist communities often believed that slave catchers could not touch them in the heart of Ohio, but they were wrong. Such was the case in 1838 in Marion County. A black man by the name of Bill Anderson, or Bill Mitchell, fled bondage in a Virginia salt works and settled near Marion, but he was soon recognized. A mail dispatch sent to Virginia caused the alleged slaveholder to demand Bill's arrest by local authorities. Forty days after his capture, six strangers appeared in Marion claiming ownership of Bill and brandishing bowie knives, pistols, and clubs. During the trial, the men, one identified as Smith, produced notes of sale showing that three of them had purchased Bill at different times with John Smith, the most recent buyer. After lengthy opening remarks, local Underground Railroad station master, Judge Aziz Bowen, rocks the courtroom by announcing, Mr. Smith and John Smith might be two different persons, therefore I shall decide in favor of the prisoner. The Virginians refused to accept the verdict. They drew weapons, Bill was jerked back and forth in a vicious tug of war, while clubs and pistols pummeled bodies. Several Quakers joined in the fight and were able to hurriedly sneak Anderson out of the courtroom and away to the home of Reuben Benedict. Reuben Benedict and his family settled this part of Delaware County in 1812. The Reuben Benedict House, located in the Alum Creek Quaker community, now in Morrow County, but originally part of Delaware County during this time period, served as the Temperance Hotel during the Stagecoach era. In 1825, the Worthington New Haven Road was completed and these buildings, among others, were used to shelter slaves. Another member of the Alum Creek Quaker community Aaron L. Benedict, grandson of Reuben Benedict and early settler of this area, was one of Samuel Patterson's neighbors and active in the Underground Railroad. Runaways used what was known as the Alum Creek Corridor. Fugitive slaves would journey from Westerville up the Alum Creek and onto stations further north, usually in Knox County. Slavery ended with President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Legally, all slaves were freed under the law and the Civil War ended. It was the beginning of a new era, but not necessarily an easy one that maintained freedom for all. It was still a long road to equality and freedom in the coming years. Though there were many locations throughout Ohio that were part of the Underground Railroad, there were also areas in the state that continued to be pro-slavery, and so the runaways and the Underground Railroad conductors had to be so careful and stay undercover so that no one would turn them in to the bounty hunters. 
Many of the sites associated with the Underground Railroad are gone. The houses, barns, and shops that concealed runaway slaves have been lost with the forces of growth and change in the city. Kathy Nelson, founder of the Friends of Freedom Society, tells us that about 40,000 slaves escaped on the Underground Railroad, but for every one that made it to freedom, between five and 10 runaways were caught and often brutally punished and returned south. The history of Africa Road and the Africa, Ohio settlement has a long and interesting history. Part of the African Road settlement is now under the waters of the Alum Creek Dam and Reservoir, where you will find this historical marker to commemorate the enslaved people who had the courage to escape the institution of slavery and to make the dangerous journey north to freedom. This program was brought to you by the Democrats. We would like to acknowledge a few of the volunteers who assisted with this program. Watson Walker, local historian and researcher and president of the Delaware County Genealogical Society. Pam Allen, former director of Hanby House, Westerville Historical Society Hanby House. Karen Hildebrand, technical and design editor, Delaware County Historical Society, and Susan Logan, advisor. I have a question about railroad from Central America to the United States. I live in a community in Honduras called Sambo Creek, and it's a Griffin of area of slaves that escaped from the Caribbean. Really? Yeah, and so the, the Garifuna in Honduras have the same kind of status as the American Indians do. They were there you know, several hundred years ago, probably even when the Spanish yeah, were yeah, started. Yeah, I couldn't know that. We know when I did it. So, yeah. so I would assume that some of these slaves coming from Haiti, Brazil, would have ended up in Florida. Is there any awareness of that? That is, okay, it, yeah. Uh, they ended up in Florida for a different reason. Uh, they stayed in Florida, but they were trying to stay from white. And uh, to escape the white control. And uh, 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 they had, uh, they had, oh, that's right, I forgot about that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that, stayed in Florida, but it escaped from the whites um, to get away from slavery there. And the Indians basically took them upon them and escaped there because they're not used to the swamp and terrorists and the whole nine yards. Yeah. So what you're saying, that's new to me. Huh. That's new to me. Because normally they would be offered to wrestle. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Um, are your books about uh, the Underground Railroad here in Delaware County? Am I? Are your books, your books, book available here? Yeah. Your question: Are your books available here? Yeah, they're available here. They still haven't printed any lately, but yes, I do have them. If you like one. Um, Name your name and address, you know, and I will promise you sometime by the end of next month that you can do this. Okay. Okay? It's not really related to the Underground Railroad, but all the other activities in Delaware. Uh, there are three different groups that we're talking about the Underground Railroad, in, in, uh, the uh, emancipated uh, slaves, and the military. You know, we had an all black uh, unit here in Del Camp Delaware. So yeah, a lot and not more information. So I do have the book. I just haven't put it in print again. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. You have a question on your iPad. Would your books be available through the historical society? Are your books available through the historical society? Yes. Leave your name and address, and say what you want to book, and we try to get that to you. 
It's not in print right now. I don't have it in print right at the moment. Was there any underground railroad sites in the town of Delaware? Yes. I can't, can't count them all. Keep in mind that they be just jazzing off. Um, one of them I could say right off the top of my head would be uh, George Gooden uh, House. It's called a halfway house, and it's a stagecoach route right here on 23 uh, in Lewis Center. And they would leave uh, what we may call Gwilton Inn without the Gatwood Inn, stop at uh, uh, Goodwood House, and then move on to Delaware. That's one site. That. Some of the ones that you have up here were the same. Uh, there was one called uh, Seven Oaks. Um, on the corner of Gurick and 315, uh, there was a father and son that still there that had a farmhouse and all. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but yeah, there's a number of them. Are the Quakers a religion or just a group of people who help with the uh, underground railroad? <laughs> no, the Quakers had their thing, just like the Methodists and all. These are a group of people who basically took the wit that they want to be part of the underground and help people get to where they need to go. Any other questions? Yes? If the slaves from the American South uh, was the only escape route north, or <coughs> could they go to Mexico or Cuba or somewhere else? That... Yes, yeah, they can go to Mexico, they can go west, they can go to Florida, uh, they can go to Caribbean, they can go through Maryland like uh, Frederick Douglass did and get on, you know, get on the boat. They put him in the boat and hit him in the boat and send him up to uh, Maryland and that way. So different other routes there. The reason this is so popular is that uh, it used to be called the Northwest Territory. You had Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, part of Minnesota. And what happened is the, the 13 colonies would, uh, had nowhere to move except west. So they wanted to go over the Alleghenies, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, the Congress passed a uh, Northwest audience to allow those individuals to uh, migrate past that. So as soon as they got a number of pop population, then they can request to be a state. So the other states came down. They all were non-slave states. Any other questions? Yes. Does Mexico have a long history of slavery or uh, of <coughs> anti-slavery? Say that Mexico. Again. What about Mexico? Does it have a long history of uh, slaveholders or is it a free uh, state? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Biden you said that uh, they did, and surprise you may not know that they the Indians also had slaves. And uh, and uh, they would go back and forth, Mexico and Texas. Texas had their thing and, and somewhat uh, had something to do with the junior uh, anniversary we have every year because they would allow people to hear about the you know, about proclamation, that they were free. Anybody else? We have a tour of underground railroad homes in Delaware County on our, on our website, www.delawareohiohistory.org. It has pictures, it has the route, so put the kids in the car, the grandkids in the car, and just take an educational drive throughout the community. Most of them have signs, but certainly not all of them. So you can find out about them on our website. Sorry. Anyone else have a question? Yes. My friend submitted one on Zoom, um, but you haven't answered it. She asked, are there any people who live here in Delaware County who um, are immediate relatives of slaves, but they still <coughs> live here? Yeah. Wilson comes to mind right now. It's, um, it, the Wilson had a uh, parent came from Bath County, Kentucky. And uh, the name was Peter, Peter and Emily. And they had uh, three uh, sons and a daughter. Uh, daughter's name was Sarah, who made a William North. Then they had three sons, one was named uh, George Washington Wilson. Uh, another was John Henry Wilson. And the third one was um, William Woods Wilson. And William Woods Wilson, uh, <coughs> some say that he was the first 
black police officers in Delaware. Uh, there was a, another person by the name of John Wesley Hardwater, depending on your time schedule, uh, when they changed the uh, formation of how you get hired in art, uh, he could have been the uh, first black officer as well. So it's one of those legitimate things. But the right off hand, that, that I would say at the top of my head would be Wilson. Uh, we have brothers named Peter and Aaron Woolley, came from Virginia, and they were former slaves that ended up living here. And the list goes on. That help? Yes, thank you. Yes. Likewise, are there still descendants of the people, the Quakers, and the people who are the safe house owners? Are there people from those, the people who actually risk their lives to have the safe houses? Um, do we know she was asking about descendants of the abolitionists and Quakers that were helping escape slavery. Are their descendants still in the area? If they are, I, I'm not aware of it. We, I think we yes, that's there. I'm not aware of that. Well, Watson, if you would answer, I think we need to do that research. Yes, yes. Pam, do you know any descendants of the Hambies that are still around? I I know descendants of the Hambies, but they're not in this area. In this area. Yeah, they're, they're they got two questions. Great, great, great grandson is an astrophysicist at Stanford they University. Uh, and he told me when you watch the news reports, if you see photographs of the sun, solar her. spots or sun flares, but that's his work. That's what he does. Now, what song did he write, his son write? Well, the abolitionist song was Darling Nellie Gray. Uh -huh. And then in um, 1864, he wrote Up on the Housetop. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, the little girl at Up on the Housetop is Little Nell. We think that's a throwback to Nellie Gray, the fugitive slave. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any questions? Yes. Did slaves always take the name of their previous masters? Not necessarily. That? Uh, that seems really dumb. No, no, that's not necessary. No. What happens is, is that whoever is your favorite person that you want to be associated with, uh, could be your neighbor down the street, uh, you may have did some work for someone in town, uh, you like that person well enough to um, take their last name. And that way God, and some people did that. And keep in mind, they start um, documenting last names starting with 1870 United States Census. So before that, depending on what location, um, majority of them, if not all of them, started in 1870. In some states and some counties started earlier than that, 1860, but majority of them was 1870. Uh, 1880, then they start uh, recognizing some other ethnic, such as Native Americans, et cetera, and that type of thing. By 1880, um, center takers before that were all white center takers. By the time 1880, 18, uh, 1900, then they, got, they got to be a little more diversified. Yes? How did how did this this uh, whole system communicate with each other, like the Underground Railroad, like the slaves? How did they know where to go? Well, they had they had uh, quotes, you know. I got a friend who knows a friend who basically did it that way. Um, uh, they had candles in the window. Uh, they had certain other phrases that they know that they're part of this network that and they use it, you know. I, there's a farmer, I got such and such a uh, package in my wagon, such and such. They know what it is, they go to it. Uh, you have conductors, you have agents. Agents normally did that, you know, lined up, you know, where you're going and all this. Conductors are people who basically transport one, to, uh, one place to another place. And you have station masters and stations, etc. So station masters may not necessarily have to be uh, doing the house. They could be the cave, they could be out in the cornfield, it could be uh, <coughs> Yes? Um, I was thinking about the candles in the windows. 
um, you know, a lot of neighbors, like, they see what other neighbors are doing, and then they emulate that. So I'm just wondering, are there any documented um, stories about, you know, people unintentionally putting out welcome signs? And then how, they, how would they react? The candles in the windows could be emulated by neighbors. Were there any documented stories of people going to the wrong house because of lights in the window? Uh, no, you know, it could be, but uh, that's on them. Uh, uh, it really no documents on that. Yes. <laughs> Just, just ask the question. I got, I got two interpreters here. <laughs> you know when the last slave ship came to the United States? When did the last slave ship come to the United States? Uh, that would be around Mobile, Alabama. And I would say close to 1850, 18, before the Civil War. Somewhere, but it's down in the area of Mobile, Alabama. Yes. Approximately how many enslaved people came through the area? About how many slaves came through the area on the Underground Railroad? We don't have crew document. Uh, I would say a, a good number of that came. Uh, best I can tell you, the activity was popular in 1820 to 1860s. Uh, before the, the Civil War started. But there's really no true document on the number of people that came to it. How many people have seen the movie Harriet? That is an amazing movie. Yeah. It's one of those that you could watch so many times over and over again. But that would give you a really good idea of how people found conductors. There were always people to help them, whether they hid them in the barn or they took them to the next conductor that, that took them on a wagon. It gives you a really good glimpse of the amazing courage that she had to have transported so many slaves. It's unbelievable. Um, one other movie I'm going to suggest is how many people have seen the movie Amistad? That is an amazing movie. Um, it's about a slave ship that was um, confiscated and they didn't know who the slaves actually belonged to. It has Matthew, Mc, Matthew McConaughey in it, which is a perfect reason to watch it, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and it has um, Anthony Hopkins in it as John Quincy Adams. And if you study this ship, the movie is so real and it's so true to life. So just a couple suggestions for extracurricular activities. Watson. Right, thank you. Thank you.